This episode of the Multi Amory Podcast is brought to you by the support of listeners like you who contribute to us on Patreon. That's P A T R E O N dot com slash Multi Amory to support our show and get some fun exclusive rewards. One thing I've noticed almost universally is that what enrages people is not so much that you do whatever it is you do, it's that you refuse to be ashamed of it. It's the lack of shame that triggers them. Um, That's interesting. It is interesting and I've never quite figured it out, but it is absolutely true. If you're happy with the same old ways of dating, if you enjoy sucking at communication, and you have no desire to improve your romantic life, then our podcast might not be for you. But if you want some out-of-the-box ideas to deepen your current relationships, broaden your sexual horizons, develop a better understanding of yourself, or learn more about non-monogamy, then you've come to the right place. I'm Jace. I'm Emily. And I'm Dedeker. And this is the Multi Amory Podcast. On this episode of the Multi Amory Podcast, we are talking with author and sex educator Janet Hardy. Janet Hardy has authored and co-authored more than 10 books, including The Ethical Slut, The New Topping and New Bottoming Books, and most recently, Spanking is for Lovers. I mean, duh. (laughs) Who else is it for? (laughs) Parents aren't allowed to do it anymore, so it's only for lovers. It's no longer for parents or children. that's true. A really good point. Wow. Oh, Mm. man. Uh, But no, seriously, we're really excited. Um, You know, obviously... Janet Hardy basically doesn't need an intro. Mm -hmm. Um, The Ethical Slut is still one of the most widely read and widely talked about books on polyamory and has been for a long time. I know it was influential for all of us. All of us, yeah. So we're really excited to have her on the show to talk about the new edition, the 20th anniversary edition that comes out today. Today. On August 15th. So can't believe it's been 20 years. <laughs> That's crazy. Yeah. Uh, so go pick it up. Get your copy. Uh, if you've lent yours out to a lover in the past and they kept it, now's a good time to get a new one. <laughs> or if you have someone you're this thinking guy. about giving it to, uh, it's a great time to get the new edition and check out all the new stuff in it. Let's get on to the interview. All right. And here we are with Janet Hardy. Hello, Janet. Hello. How are you all doing? <laughs> doing well. well. Thank you so Thank much you. for being here. We're excited to have you on the show. It's been a long time coming, I think. Yeah, We've definitely. talked about this for a while. Oh, happy to do it. Uh, so we we met you recently uh, at a panel where Dedeker was also speaking. Uh, and at that, you were talking about the new, 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 new edition of The Ethical Slut that is coming out on, uh, when is it? August? August 15th. 15th. Because yeah, we all have read the second edition, correct, guys? Yeah. That yeah. Was a, yeah, that's. Yeah, yeah that's the, the one that we had. Holly book I read. Yeah. Yeah, I wanted to take a minute, really quick, just for us to talk about like how much of an impact that book in particular had. I mean, I know in my life, like that was definitely the first book that I read um, that covered the subject in such a way that was so accessible and I guess mm-hmm. made it very real for me. Oh, you know, like, like, like it was it was my first exposure to like, oh, people actually do this. It's not just like a fantastic theory. Um, and I mean, it was very pivotal for me kind of in my own development of figuring out what it is that I wanted to do in relationships. And I feel like, Emily, you kind of had a similar experience. Yeah, just the ability to have like an actual how-to book on, you know, non-monogamous relationships, especially when you're first starting out and not really knowing what you're dropping into to a certain degree is huge for me, um, and it was. And I I lent my copy to an ex lover, <laughs> and he still has it, and I want it oh, back no. now. But I know. <laughs> I'm, to- I'm totally um, but- convinced that's why the book has done as well as it has, is because people exactly. buy them and give them to all their lovers, and uh, you know, we, we've never put a dime into well, advertising it. That's how it gets it gets sold. Mm-hmm. Exactly. I mean, it's fine. He can keep it, and I'll just get the third edition once <laughs> yeah, it comes out. <laughs> so, perfect. Uh-huh. I, I do have a question just on that note, Janet. I mean, when you guys were first writing this book, did you have any kind of sense that it would become as popular as it did? Not a freaking clue. Nobody is more surprised <laughs> than us. 
um, <laughs> started it, uh, the, the precipitating event on it was we had already written the bottoming book and the topping book, which were SM books, or oh. now they say BDSM books. Um, and so we were giving a talk out of all places, a Mensa conference about the basic BDSM. <laughs> So we gave our talk, and like we always do, we teach a lot from our own experience. So fine, we did the workshop, it was good. Um, and Dossie went home because it was way too hetero around there for her, but I was still there. <laughs> and that night there was a hot tub event and I ran into a friend of mine at the tubs. And she said, you should have heard the conversation in my hot tub. I said, okay, <laughs> tell, tell. And she said, the conversation in my hot tub was, did you hear about that S&M talk this morning? There were these two women doing it, and they were talking about things they had done together, and one of their boyfriends was right in the room. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, up until that moment, we had thought that the kink was the outrageous stuff that we did. Mm. But at that moment, we realized that Polly or non-monogamy or whatever you call it um was much more outrageous to most people you know the bdsm if you're not into it then you can just sort of shove it aside and it's that weird thing that other people do but everybody has to confront questions of monogamy mm. uh, in their lives no matter what they yeah. end on they have to at least wrestle with the question and so it it hit home much deeper and to a much larger audience than we began to know at the time that we were doing it. Mm -hmm. That was you know, about 1995 that we started work on this. And wow, wow. the first edition came out in 97. This one coming up is the 20th anniversary edition, which we find uh -oh. really, <laughs> I, I can't even tell you, you know, the, the, <laughs> the idea that there will be people reading this edition who have never lived on a planet where the ethical slut was not in print. Yeah. Gosh. That's yeah. Impressive. That's yeah. crazy. Wow. <laughs> Gosh. I never. Even, I never. Yeah. My little sister has Your lived in a world where where the ethical slut has always existed, and now she can read yeah. it. Oh. Wow. Yeah. Wow. So aside from well, making so us I, feel very old, which happens all the time, it's also. <laughs> I think that you hit on something. Um. Because I think it is telling how popular the book became after you guys put it out there and. I think that something that we talked about with Elizabeth Schaff when she was on our show was was talking about this idea that like, sure, people can see something that's kinky or maybe they can see BDSM play and they can think again, like, well, I've never really felt an affinity for that. I Maybe I've never fantasized about being tied up or I've never fantasized about dominating somebody. And so like, I can't quite relate to that. But most people have experienced the experience of like feeling attraction or being interested in somebody who's not your partner. Most people have experienced having to make that decision of moment of like, okay, is now the time that the relationship is exclusive or do I keep dating, you know? And so there's something about it that can kind of strike to the core of people in a way that's either very exciting for them or, or very confronting and challenging for them. And I think that mm -hmm. like how prolific the book became is a testament to that exactly. When it first came out, the first edition back in 97, we were doing a lot of radio talk shows, um, mostly at ridiculous hours of the morning because we're on the West Coast <laughs> and we were doing morning drive. Um, but it was shocking to us how angry people got. We'd never oh, encountered wow. that before. And that was what I came down to with it, is imagining myself as someone who had spent my life monogamous, not because that was my choice, but because nobody had ever told me that there was another way to be. And now here mm -hmm. I am, 40, 50, 60, whatever, and I've been miserably monogamous for however many years, and here's some woman on the radio telling me that I never had to be. I would be mm -hmm. livid. I would be fucking furious. And I would yeah. probably not be, at, at first, um, self-aware enough to turn my anger toward the people who told me wrong things in the first place. I would probably be angry mm -hmm. at the woman on the radio. So yeah, I, try, I try to have compassion. Yeah. I try. I'm not always as good at it as I wish, but I try. I, I wanted to ask, Janet, if you still find that reaction to be true, if people are still um, 
upset and angry in the same way that they once were because I know when I became polyamorous, my best friend at the time was very angry with me that I was doing that and she was getting married and it kind of was this, you know, thing against exactly the kind of life that she was choosing for herself. Um, I don't know if that's changed. Like, I, I'm interested to see kind of the trajectory of of the journey of how far the book has come and how far polyamory has come in the mainstream media. Well, it's, it's just... definitely better. I mean, incrementally better. But um, mm -hmm. I think most of them have a chance to express their rage before they get to me. You know, <laughs> the, the Newsweek cover story, the multiple television shows, the, you know, various movie stars who have come out as varying flavors of poly. Um, we don't have the shock factor anymore that we did in 1997. So the, uh, maybe it's that they've already used up all their rage by the time they get to me, or maybe it's just that it's spread thinner, but I don't encounter that kind of hostility nearly as often as I did before. One thing, I, great. Great. One thing I've noticed almost universally is that what enrages people is not so much that you do whatever it is you do, it's that you refuse to be ashamed of it. It's the lack of shame that triggers them. Um, That's fascinating. interesting. It is interesting and I've never quite figured it out, but it is absolutely true. Wow. Yeah, I mean, that's it makes a lot of sense because I, I feel like it resonates with a lot of the struggles with not only sex positivity, but also um, you know, also the struggle for gay rights and like there's been a lot of different ways I've seen that play out. Yeah, where it's this kind of like, you know, maybe people can relate to a certain extent to either kinky things that you want to do or or even just with sex positivity like that that you know studies have shown a lot of people like casual sex but we're taught to be ashamed of it and so if someone else isn't ashamed it's like oh fuck you like you're such a player or like oh god you're a slut or whatever it is because it's i'm so angry that you're not ashamed because i am and i have to deal with that all the time so you should too yeah um the archetypal um fundamentalist uh, homophobic uh politician who gets caught in a hotel room with a rent boy. Uh, you know, yeah. we, we see it in, in politics all the time. And mm. he's, you know, such people are operating from deep shame. Uh, and so of course they are enraged by those of us who are taking freely what they dream of in a very shame, ashamed way. That That is mm. enraging. Yeah. Uh, so, can you tell us a little bit about, like, before we get into the changes in the book, uh, a little bit about, like, what changes you've seen specifically in the poly community over the 20 years since the book came out? So not just about the public accepting it, but in the community itself. That's a really interesting question. And I would say one of the issues we had, even in 1997, was the amount of fragmentation we saw among people who we considered to be pretty much all kinky or all slutty, all non-monogamous, all whatever you want to call it. But I remember when we were working on the first edition, I went to a Bay Area munch. Actually, it was a picnic, I think, a poly picnic. And, you know, when the time came for people to introduce themselves, I introduced myself and explained that I was working with my colleague on a book about poly. And during the break, one of the leaders took me aside and said, well, Deborah Annapol already wrote the book about Polly. Why should there be another one? Mm. <laughs> <laughs> which is an interesting question in, a, in and of itself. But I said, well, Deborah wrote a great book, which she did, on the flavor of Polly that is about long-term multi-partner relationships. We wanted to write a book that encompasses casual relationships and fuck buddy relationships and once a year really all, all of those and he said oh you mean tertiary relationships <laughs> and i said no i mean like the guy on the other side of the glory hole and his face kind of all came apart um but we really felt and feel like anybody who recognizes that monogamy is not the only healthy and ethical way to live your life we're all on the same side including people who have chosen monogamy 
uh, mm -hmm. in an educated way. Uh, we all have much more in common than we have different. And so I get a little crazy, um, and it's not gotten better over the last 20 years, with this dreadful taxonomy of, well, I'm polyamorous, and he's polyfuckerous, and she's a relationship anarchist, and, 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 you can name them better than I can. And I don't understand <laughs> why. I don't understand why we need that when what we're all trying to do is build lives according to our desires. And I think mm -hmm. starting by the definition of what kind of relationship you want and then going out and auditioning people for that relationship is pretty much, mu much what monogamous people have been doing all along. And it's not really a very good way to approach relationships, mm -hmm. in my opinion. So I, I, I really mm -hmm. hate to see um, we sluts doing the same mistakes that we thought we were helping to get rid of. Yeah. 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 Uh, sorry, I just want to like gush about that a little bit, unless you want to yeah, hop in. Um, yeah, well, it reminds me of, you know, the section in the ethical slut that resonated with me the most and the section that I've revisited the most over the years is uh, your guys' little interlude on clean love on loving without expectation like that i've come back to again and again and again because it seems like it's, it's always relevant regardless of what's mm -hmm. going on in my life um and i kind of wanted to take a little sidetrack there to talk about your relationship with dossie actually specifically um because i think that that's such an excellent relationship that models this idea that a relationship can be whatever that it doesn't have to fit into these perfect little boxes, it doesn't have to fit under this perfect little label, that it can be very intense and it can be lifelong, but it doesn't have to cohabit or always be sexual or always be romantic or always inco incorporate co-parenting. And I think I would echo the sentiment that you just said that it is hard to see people who are in the non-monogamous scene or the kinky scene or just the non-traditional relationship scene, but are still very much in this mindset of like, I gotta keep the labels straight and yeah. I gotta keep make sure that I know that the exact trajectory of every relationship. Um, I mean, do people, if I feel like at the panel uh, a couple of weeks ago that we were speaking, it, it seemed like you still had to explain to people to get them to wrap their minds around your relationship with Dossie. Um, yeah, yeah. Do you mind speaking about that a little bit? Well, you know, I, I do the shtick that I probably did on the same panel about Dossie's and my <laughs> relationship. Um, and how we have been variously friends, colleagues, lovers, um, inner circle with each other for 25 years now, quarter century. Um, if mm. we ever tried to live together for more than the weekend that we spend speaking at a conference, we would have to kill each other. <laughs> we would have to. <laughs> well, you know, she has this thing about wanting things to have places where they fit and putting them in those places when you're done with them. And also this very bizarre belief system that you're only supposed to spend money that you actually have. And, I, you know, it's those are not good things to form a live-in partnership behind. Those are the things that end relationships. Um, as it is, we can have the stuff that is good, which is a very dear friendship and collaboration and sometimes lovership, um, and leave out the stuff that don't. Uh, we've had only a few fights through the years. They have been horrible. We're, we're both conflict aversive to a fault. And so when we do fight, it's awful. It's, it's <laughs> the earth shakes and it's always money. It, it, we, we fight about money. The, the other stuff is easy. Um, but we have very different values around money, and it happens that the nature of this relationship involves money because there's a book. Mm. There's yeah. four books. Um, and so that that's where, and, and, you know, money has ended better relationships than ours. And if we tried to do it at the same time as we were sharing a roof, holy crap, I can't imagine. <laughs> so it's... <laughs> It's hard for, you know, I, right now my, like, the person who's sleeping downstairs from me right now is a person that I love deeply, that I am in fact married to, and with whom I have had genitals, well, I've never had intercourse with them. Um, I've had genital sex, I think, twice in the 13 years we've been together. Um, that's just not what our relationship is based on. Uh, and. Yeah. 
if we tried to make that be the thing that our relationship is based on, there are both health concerns and different desire concerns that would probably make it very difficult for us to, to build a relationship on that. But instead, we cohabit very easily. We're both highly domestic people. And a lot of our life as a couple is built around fussing with the house and the yard and the dogs and, and all that. And it's great. You know, if one of us feels the need to get laid, that's there as, a, as an option. Um, and we just arrange for that to happen. It's been a while, admittedly. We're not in yet. We're not as young as we used to be, but if we wanted to, we could. Um, and I, I intend for this relationship to be the one I'm in when one of us has to say goodbye to the other at the end. So I'm not sure that relationships based on the Western picture of romantic love, which is often a very dysfunctional picture. Um, I don't think those are designed to last that long. You know, of my long-term relationships, I've had one that was what Hollywood tells us we should want. It was the sexual heat. It was that intensity, that passion. And it was the least healthy relationship I've been in. I, I do better with the ones where sex is pleasant and occasional and things work smoothly on other levels. And if I feel the need to get all hot and heavy and passionate again, which occasionally, you know, it's springtime, I occasionally get the urge, then I go out and find someone to do that with. Yeah, I, I love that. That yeah, That's something that, that I always try to get across to people too, is that that being in a relationship, which even as a term is hard because it's such a broad thing. Yes. Um, but just having that label doesn't, have to carry with it well that means we have to do this 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 and the other thing yeah. just like the label of being friends doesn't mean we have to do these and can't do these like yeah. that yeah. that there's this freedom to choose what works for you within each of those um so i, I love that that example you give when we have that expectation of a relationship we put such a burden on it that absolutely you have to get your sex and your friendship and your intimacy and your nurturing and your fun and your children and all of those from the same person that's mm -hmm. i mean it works for some people but it does not work for a lot of people um and i think we do incalculable harm both to our social structure and to our sense of self when we make it that if your relationship isn't doing all those things, then you're broken somehow. You're doing it wrong and there's something wrong with you. So we're gonna take a quick break to talk to you guys again about Patreon. Um, the reason why this show continues to exist is because we're getting listener support through Patreon. It's just been so fantastic. And I looked, it's been almost like a year exactly since we launched yeah. our Patreon. And thank goodness we did, because not only has it helped us get funding, but it's also helped us to actually connect to our listeners in this really awesome, up close and personal way. Like that's my favorite part. So well, it's allowed us to do things like live shows yes, and start yes. developing tours, merchandise, developing, get some exactly. new artwork, like exactly. all sorts of stuff has been made possible because of the support from listeners like you. Mm -hmm. So if you guys go to patreon.com slash multiamory, you can sign up, become one of our Patreon supporters. We offer various different exclusive rewards to our different supporters. If you pledge at the $5 a month level, you get access to our private patron only Facebook group, um, which is a totally private discussion group where people are able to post silly pictures of them and all their partners or to post asking for advice about a particular situation in their relationship that they're dealing with. Um, mm -hmm. It's been a fantastic community. I really love being a part of it. And you can be a part of it too if you go to patreon.com slash multiamory. And the other way that you can support our show, if you are not in the mood to spend some moolah on us, um, <laughs> is to go to iTunes or Stitcher, I believe, as well. Mm -hmm. um, and you can write a review. Uh, it helps us uh, appear higher in search results. Um, in addition, it just it, one of the reasons why I do this show is because... Um, I get to find out the ways in which we've helped people, and that's just unbelievable. And often uh, people talk about that on the reviews. It makes us weepy and teary and um, <laughs> just means so, so much to us. So, again, if you uh, haven't already, take the time to go on iTunes or Stitcher and write us a review. We really, really would appreciate it. 
All right, let's get back to it. So I want to really quickly kind of look to the future because what I see in our generation, and I guess we decided that we're millennials. <laughs> um, I guess technically we're millennials. Even you, Jace. <laughs> um, you know, when I when I look at like what my peers are doing as far as relationships go, like on the one side, I think that many of us grew up uh, children of divorce. So I think that like many of us grew up seeing like, oh, maybe this long-term married monogamy thing is not the be all end all. You know, maybe that's not what I should be going after. And so there's that, there's like kind of that openness to trying to find something other than monogamy or like the monogamy that we saw our parents practicing. At the same time, our generation also grew up in the middle of the, like the AIDS scare in the 80s, where I think that, um, you know, there was a lot of backlash against healthy, casual sex and just a lot of backlash against sex in general. And so we also still got instilled with a lot of sex negativity. And so mm-hmm. like, our generation specifically, I don't necessarily see as being the revolutionary generation that completely turns relationships on their heads and gets rid of the marriage status quo. I think we're trying, like I see people vacillating, um, but I'm curious to know what it is that you see on the horizon as far as you know non-traditional and alternative relationships go. I, I think where we're seeing the most action and the most excitement is in half a generation after years, the ones who are in high school and college mm-hmm. right now. Um, yeah. it's, it's becoming fairly commonplace for me to, when I speak to such audiences, for there to be a significant sprinkling of second generation poly people in the audience. Um, yeah, yeah. In one case, I had a third generation poly person in my audience, which was wow. awesome. And because they grew up in a world where even if they didn't see it at home, they saw it on television, they read about it, um, but for any any uh, value of it, whether that's um, relationships or sexuality or gender or whatever. Um, They don't have to spend the first 10 years of their lives as adults swimming upstream against all these cultural no-nos so that they can start Mm -hmm. fresh and take it from there. They're like, they're like the sparrow that's been fly- riding on the back of the eagle and then they get to go higher. Um, I'm going to be <laughs> really curious to see what they make of all this. Um, wow. Wow. What I see is that they're treating all of that, all of the sex and relationships and gender and all those choices as like this buffet. And they don't have to go in there and say, I am a sadomasochist, therefore I'm going to eat only what's on this part of the table. They take a little bit off of every part of the table. They try it all. And some of it tastes good and they want more and some of it doesn't taste good. So they don't take any more of that, Uh, which is kind of what I wanted all along. It it makes me really happy to see. Um, It makes them really hard to market books to, but that's a a separate (laughs) problem altogether. Um, You know, I think that's all any of us ever wanted some of them are going to choose monogamy and that's because monogamy is an excellent choice Mm -hmm. if you choose it as a choice if you don't just pick it because it's the only thing you know you have open to you um Mm -hmm. i think monogamy works really well for a great many people but nothing works well for someone who has not had free agency in choosing it yeah yeah, definitely. We keep coming back to this image of the buffet. We've come to that before yeah, we've in talked yeah, previous, about with Carrie previous Jenkins podcasts. as well. Yeah, yeah, like this idea yeah. of having the freedom to kind of pick and choose what it is that makes you happy and gets you going and the idea that not every plate or not every relationship has to be comprised of the same things. That mm-hmm. image seems to come up a lot. Yes. Uh, anytime we talk about sex, the, the metaphors tend to go to food. Um, <laughs> there, there's, a, there's a paper there to be written for... Uh-huh. A sociology major, maybe I, I don't even know who the major would be on that. But there's a reason. There must be a reason why we keep going back to food metaphors when we try to explain sex. Um, and I think Anthony Bourdain like wrote an essay about like food as pornography a right. while ago I, before remember, before he blew yeah. up. Like I think that was one of his big things. But, yeah. yeah. Well, they're both so sensual and yeah. tactile yeah. and yeah, and very primal, I suppose. And, yeah. and at least in theory, not morally fraught. In mm. theory. In the, you know, these days I know people who are much more, lay, lay a much heavier moral burden on what they eat than they do on who they fuck. <laughs> <laughs> That's a different rant for a different show, so we won't move. <laughs> 
Um, so <laughs> we've all read the second edition, and we're very, very interested to hear what is going to happen in the third edition. So can you explain a little bit about what to expect in the new edition? Uh, the, the first thing you'll notice as being very different in the new edition is that we've radically shifted um, our verbiage around gender. Because even nine years ago, seven or nine years, I forget, when the second edition came out, uh, non-binary language was not commonplace. Mm -hmm. um, so we've switched our pronouns, of course. But the other thing we're being very careful about is generalizations about men or women. Because when we looked at, for example, our section about unwanted pregnancies, we talked about men and women and... Today, we, I think we've changed it to talk about testicle owners and uterus owners, because that, that's what is pretty critical when you're thinking about unwanted pregnancies. Um, and so there, there's a lot of, we've had to think a lot more carefully about what it was we were actually trying to say when we talk about gender. So that's the first big change. Um, the next big change is that we, we found out we had a lot of things that we wanted to talk about that were relevant, but that didn't fit smoothly into the flow of the text. So we wrote a lot of sidebars that some of them were about poly pioneers. We wrote a sidebar about Alfred Kinsey and the Kinsey Institute. Uh, we wrote a sidebar about the, Ober uh, the um, Morning Glory and Oberon um, Ravenheart and Zell family, which huge extended family that's existed for like 30 years now. Um, I forget who all else, but we, we did several sidebars. <laughs> oh, we did an Oneida side, sidebar. Um, oh, and a sidebar about uh, the Molson, Mar Molson Marston family. Mm -hmm. the, yeah, the, yeah the, the triad that produced Wonder Woman. They're, mm -hmm. they're getting a whole movie about mm -hmm. them yeah, this yeah, year, yeah. which makes me nice. totally happy. Oh, really? Yes, yes. They, um, Professor Marston and the Wonder Women. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Excellent. Yep, I can't wait. Uh, <laughs> and we also, there, there was some stuff that we felt deserved some talk, but that again, it would have stopped the text while we wandered off. And, and so there's a sidebar about people of color in Polly. There's a sidebar about um, the folks we were just talking about, the post-millennial generation and Polly. Mm -hmm. In both of those, we relied heavily on interviews with the people in question because we are both white and old. So we didn't really <laughs> feel that those were the art story to tell. Um, and I think the clean love that you loved so much, which I have to tell Dossie that that's your favorite part because that was really her baby. Uh, I think we Aww. broke that out into a sidebar <laughs> so that people could really see it. Um, so stuff like that. And also just because we feel like the, the era of the flat gray column of type is over because people have grown up seeing things online and they want graphics and pictures. So there's call outs throughout the text of quotes that we particularly like. So those pop off the page. Mm -hmm. um, and beyond that, we wrote a whole section, uh, a whole chapter about consent culture. Uh, we wrote oh, great. a big new chunk of the finding community because that goes on changing. Um, oh gosh, yes. Yeah, right. <laughs> um, yeah. And a lot of other smaller changes. We mm -hmm. set out to not do substantial changes, but we actually did wind up doing a fair number of substantial changes. <laughs> the the <laughs> fundamental structure of the book has not changed the way it did between the first and second mm -hmm. editions. We haven't taken anything apart and moved it around, but uh, but there's a lot more juice and a lot more mm -hmm. depth in, in some of the sections. That's so great and that's so exciting. And I think it's so wonderful the fact that you that both of you have had the opportunity to revisit the text and to update it and to expand it. I know that I mean my own book came out uh, like four months ago and I'm already like God when can I revise that thing like already I'm like oh there's already so much that I want to add and want to change and, and so I think it's I think it's so good to know that you guys have been able to like live more life experience and to learn more and to see the way that culture has shifted and to see the, the way that different generations and different communities are, are tackling poly and to be able to then incorporate that back into your work is so great. And I think it's so great that it means that it's gonna be something that stays evergreen and that stays relevant and that stays useful to people for many more years. 
Yeah, yeah. usually, you know, running Greenery Press, um, I usually figure every 10 years is about the right duration mm. to update a book. But our publisher actually appro approached us with the idea of a 20th anniversary edition. Oh, and it hasn't been quite 10 years, but it was lovely to be asked. And, you know, money is always a good thing. So, yeah. And this time we, we have a little um, silver starburst on the front cover that says 200,000 copies sold, which makes us oh, wow. really happy. Fancy. <laughs> That's, awesome. That's great. That's so awesome to see. I mean, I, I remember first stumbling upon the book, I think in 2005, just randomly wow. at a bookstore. Wow. Uh, a long time ago. And just kind of one of those like, like no one's looking. I'll just flip through this a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> That's how it works. Uh, and yeah. didn't, didn't buy it at the time. I wasn't at that point in my life yet. <laughs> but I remember coming across it and then you know, years later, this book coming back and being such a central book in this community that I'm now, yeah. you know, such a part of, uh, it is kind of funny to look back on, wow, look at how, how far I've come. And now it's fun to see how far the book has come as well. Uh, something I wish I had started doing back in 97 when the first edition came out is I've worked any number of trade shows and street fairs where I've sold, sold books um, out of a booth. And in 2020 hindsight, what I wish I had done is set up a little camera uh, tracking the double takes that that title has gotten from people for the years, <laughs> <laughs> because it's just a joy to watch people start to walk by and then you see their attention zoom back and then they come over and look at it and then they look up and give me this big grin and say, this is about me. And I say, yes, it is about you. You should buy one. <laughs> That's lovely. Aww. That's wonderful. I, I first, I remember now, I first got turned onto the book um, from a women's porn magazine, actually. Really? really? Oh my goodness. There was this, um, this British magazine called Filament that unfortunately was only in print for like, maybe a year or two and they were I, I swear to god this magazine was written for me because like first of all they were like the first like women's pornographic magazine in the UK to like actually print images of men with erections like not just like shirtless men and then also like and they also had this commitment to like having no stories about celebrities nothing about fashion nothing about makeup um huh. like it was all stories that were like interviews with video game developers and talking about consent That's and like awesome. erotic fiction and so like i absolutely freaking loved this magazine i was so sad when it folded um but yeah they did a whole feature on non-monogamy and that was one of my first exposures to it and that was how i heard about the ethical slut and of course with that title i was like i gotta <laughs> i gotta get to the bottom of that one <laughs> yeah yeah yeah. Now, yeah probably what happened on that is that was back when greenery was still publishing it was that the first edition do you remember i think it, well I don't, I don't remember no um back when it was still a greenery book it was distributed in the uk by turnaround books in london which has a wonderful track record of bringing alternative points of view across the ocean and they used to do a very good job of sending review copies out to the british media so we got a lot mm. of publicity over there um from them have you ever looked at archer magazine from australia archer? From in Australia, yeah. it, it's another. Yeah. It's it's a, an annual magazine of sex positive culture, and it's it's the magazine I would do if I felt like doing a magazine. Um, <laughs> it's it's physically gorgeous. It's intelligently written. I, I not not specifically for women, although I think women would feel much more comfort in it than in a, a most magazines. But uh, very queer, very varied. It, it, it's lovely. Mm -hmm. Nice. Let's take a look at that. That's, That's awesome. Awesome. Well, I think we're coming to the end here, but Janet, we have um, one question that we ask all of our guests, and I feel like it's a little hard to ask you this question because you've written so many books on this topic already, but <laughs> the question that we ask everybody is if you were going to give just one piece of advice to somebody who's new to this, who's like new to non-monogamy or new to polyamory, if you had to pick one piece of advice, what would it be? Um just because you fuck up doesn't mean there's anything wrong with you and it doesn't mean you're doing it wrong everybody fucks up i fuck up mm. dossie fucks up <laughs> it, 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 we are walking a road that is not paved we are hacking our way through the underbrush with our own machetes which sometimes are sharp and sometimes they're not sharp <laughs> and that means we're going to go off the path sometimes 
and how you judge a good slut is not by whether they make mistakes, but by how they make up for the mistakes they've made and whether they make the same mistake over and over. Um, yeah. So you're not going to learn if you don't make, make mistakes. Um, and so just expect to do so. Well, I know Beautiful. I fucked up. <laughs> yeah, oh, I sure yeah, have yeah, too. On this, on this yeah. show, I have not fucked up because I've never yet met a person in any kind of relationship <laughs> style that has not fucked up. <laughs> the three of us have definitely been the recipients of each other's fuck ups a lot. Many so. times. <laughs> <laughs> That's also true. <laughs> We've handed out our fuck ups to many people. Also, uh, yeah. it's just the gift yes. that keeps on giving. Yes, generosity. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thank you so much, Janet. Um, hopefully we'll have you on the show in another 20 years <laughs> just kidding yeah, to talk about the next edition <laughs> oh my god I can't begin to think about what I'm going to be you know that'll put me in my early 80s I suppose I could still wow. be doing this in my early 80s um, alright why the heck not <laughs> well okay. our podcast will be in virtual reality by then oh, so that'll be great, it'll be yeah. great. Yeah. Yeah. I'll have the chip impl- implanted yeah. under my skin and we can just talk uh, that way perfect, perfect. Yeah. Yeah. great all right. Well, thank you so much to Janet Hardy for being on the show. I hope that all of you got as much out of that as I did. Um, I love hearing her talk and her perspective that she has on this community and the way that it's changed over time. Um, both the poly community and also the BDSM community uh, has been super fascinating. Getting to talk to someone who's been such an influential figure in both of those arenas mm-hmm. for so long. It's really yeah, cool. Yeah, she's lovely. Definitely yeah. got a little teary-eyed at points during that Vah. interview. Vah. Vah, vah. Uh, so if you have any questions or specific topics that you would like us to talk about on the show, the best way to do that is to call our phone number, leave us a voicemail, and let us know. You can do that at 678-MULTI-05. That's 678-MULTI-05. And for international listeners, you can send us a Facebook audio message uh, through our Facebook page. Um, And we can play those on the show and discuss your question or your topic. You can also email us feedback at info at multiamory.com, or you can send us a message on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, follow us on all of those things to get updates as well as sign up for our newsletter. To support our show, you can join our private Facebook community and go to patreon.com slash multiamory. Multiamory is created and produced by Emily Sotelo Matlack, Dedeker Winston, and me, Jace Lindgren. Our episodes are edited by Mauricio. Our social media wizard is Will McMillan. Our theme song is Forms I Know I Did by Josh and Anand from the Fractal Cave EP. Hi, this is Princess Callie, author of Enough to Make You Blush and founder of KinkAcademy.com. You're listening to a Swing Set podcast at swingset.fm. <laughs> I just have to say I love yeah I love both of your guys' beatboxing so much it's so bad shut up okay <laughs> shut up I thought mine wasn't so bad no I will really say bad. Emily's is a little bad. bit better than Dedeker's yeah well <laughs>